by uh, Prism partner BBC Philharmonic and RN Sim soloist Vanessa Guinardi. We're going to be looking at music and poetry generated by AI and thinking about how this might fit into the creative process and what this might mean for sort of classical music and music in general, this kind of technology, um, and how you can work together um, to interpret this material, uh, which is a really interesting question um, because it's material that's generated by a computer and has a different kind of meaning, or maybe no meaning, um, compared to uh, maybe setting a text written by a human, for example. Just before we start on these two uh, areas of research, so the, the String Quartet BBC Philharmonic project and the uh, songs that we're going to look at later, I just want to zoom out a little bit and talk about AI in general. Um, what is AI? What do we mean by AI? And why are we so interested here at PRISM in AI? Um, you'll probably notice that this isn't the only event today um, that's uh, focused on AI and machine learning. We have lots of other um, exciting things going on, including the launch of Sample RNN, which is very, very exciting. So I can only really speak about my own research, um, which is as a doctoral student, um, tackling the question of um, what impact can this kind of technology have on the creative process? Um, how might it change the way that we approach making music? Um, how might it let us build up a new vocabulary, a new way of thinking about music? So just very briefly to finish off this introduction, uh, just to put a little bit more detail about what we mean by AI. So we're not talking about um, sort of conscious minds like Howl from 2001 or Skynet from The Terminator. That kind of thing is, is what researchers call AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. And the best guess they've got as how to build that up is by using lots and lots of branches of AI together to, you know, to collaborate within different fields of computer science to create AGI. One of those areas, those sub-areas, is machine learning. And machine learning is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so machine learning is, is when you get an algorithm to learn from a data set, and that data set might be music, it might be text, it might be images, whatever you want, and it just uh, analyzes the data again and again, it goes round and round and round, every time getting slightly more accurate, understanding slightly more about how that data is made up. Um, so machine learning is what we're going to be using today, and in particular we're going to be using a type of machine learning algorithm called a recurrent neural network. So a neural network is just how uh, machine learning works. That's what we call the algorithms because um, the scientists who invented them wanted to model um, this kind of technology on the human brain. So it has these things called neurons that connect. And the recurrent bit of recurrent neural network means that when it produces material like music or text, it produces it one character at a time um, and it learns one character at a time. So that's how it learns English, that's how it learns the rules of music. It sort of looks at everything in, in minute detail and then begins to zoom out. So let's dive straight in um, to the string quartet, uh, Parallel Endings, which is written for the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. Okay, so Parallel Endings. What's this piece and what's going on with it? Why is it in this session? The BBC Philharmonic asked me to run a pre-concert event for them uh, back in February. Um, which was uh, sort of like a 45 minute audience interaction, participatory, informationy, uh, performancey, sort of cross stylistically, all those kind of words. Uh, it was a fun experience for everyone involved, and it was performances of music and sort of talking about AI a little bit. And that concert um, was a Beethoven feature. Um, so it had uh, in the programme of Beethoven's Eroica Symphony, a uh, selection of uh, pieces from the creatures of Prometheus um, and the song for soprano and orchestra op fair lead um, and I was trying to think about how uh, you might use AI to sort of uh, cast a new light on, on Beethoven and I was sort of trying to work out how I might be able to sort of get a new angle on this material and I was particularly drawn to this piece op fair lead um, because it's, it's not very well known um, and I should think that most people in the audience probably hadn't heard it before uh, and therefore we're going into that experience um, with quite an open mind and we're very unfamiliar with the music they're about to hear. And since this uh, event was before the concert, um, I decided that actually what I wanted to do was to use AI um, partly as a way of sort of thinking about creativity and about uh, how Beethoven is sort of shown as to be the, the lone genius kind of thing, um, but also to prime their ears for Opferlied. 
So what I wanted to do with this piece was simply to take the first phrase of opera lead, sung by the, uh, the soprano, and uh, cut it in half. So I take the first half of that phrase and I give that as a, a prompt uh, to the machine learning algorithm. A prompt is when you uh, give the algorithm something to start and then you say, well, please finish this in, in whatever style. So in this case, I've got it to complete it in Beethoven's style. Um, so the prompt is the first half of the phrase, which goes like this. Okay, um, and Beethoven obviously uh, wrote a second half of that phrase and the rest of the piece, indeed. Um, and what I wanted to bring attention to here was the fact that um, while AI can be very creative, um, it's perhaps creative in a different way. Every time you ask the uh, machine learning algorithm um, to complete this phrase, it comes out with something completely different, but that is in its mind an equally likely outcome to the first half of the phrase. It's like maths. It's got this sort of probability curve and it just sort of selects um, one from there. And interestingly, it doesn't really mind which ending it does. You know, um, I've ran this many times and I've got about 30 different endings to this, this phrase, 30 parallel endings, um, hence the title. And they're all quite different, you'll hear them later. And it kind of challenges that idea of um, what inherently is the music and what kind of decision making process was Beethoven going through. If Beethoven wrote up for lead on a different day, um, or perhaps just you know at a different time of day or in a different place, um, if circumstances had been changed, would the piece remain the same? Would he still write the same thing as he did, or uh, is he, in a sense, uh, selecting from this probability curve as well? Um, and as composers, I think we often get uh, caught up. Well, not just composers actually, anyone who enjoys classical music um, often gets caught up in this idea that that's the way the piece is and um, this is the, the piece of music and this is how it's written and it's kind of always going to end up like that. And I was quite interested in using this sort of pure probabilistic uh, algorithmic approach to show many parallel endings. The way to think about this, that I think about it, is like a wave function in, in quantum mechanics where you have um, before the wave function collapses, uh, the location of a particle, for example, might be simultaneously in many places at once. And there's the chance that it's here, there's more chance that it's here, and there's not very much chance that it's here, but there is still a chance. And that ending to that particle, or the ending to this phrase, is still a valid one. And you might think of Beethoven as kind of collapsing that wave function and selecting this ending. This is the way that it works. And in this piece, I simply wanted to present many different endings. Um, so it's got about 25 uh, parallel endings to the piece, um, and they're just kind of put one after, another, one after another, sometimes on top of each other. It kind of gets you primed in this sort of op for lead world. Of course, none of them are actually what Beethoven wrote. So the algorithm in question is uh, called Newsnet, which is developed by OpenAI, um, a uh, tech firm uh, based in San Francisco. Um, and this um, uh, machine learning algorithm um, is a transformer. So that's a type of recurrent neural network that we talked about before. And the way that it's trained is that it's trained on a million, loads of hours of music. I'm not even sure. I think it's more than a million hours of music in general. So it learns the rules of music. You know, it learns how uh, violins work, maybe. Um, it learns, uh, you know, how often composers write parallel fifths and, and when they don't. It learns what chords might follow which, um, you know, maybe the tonic after the dominant, that kind of thing. It learns that from this big data set. And then it's fine-tuned on Beethoven's music, which means that once it's learned everything, you say, OK, you know the general rules, but I want you to apply this with Beethoven's fingerprint. Uh, this is an algorithm I've used quite a lot before, and in fact, we have fine-tuned it on my own music, and that's a really exciting thing to do as well, because um, there are some elements of your own music that uh, you would think an algorithm wouldn't be able to pick up, no matter how uh, effective it is. Um, and some elements you think might be really obvious, and you might be surprised. So, you know, my own music, it picks up uh, some of my jazz influences very easily, um, but has absolutely no idea how to structure a piece in, in the way that I might normally do that.
I guess just a little word about zoomed out about um, how this piece was created. So I've described the creative methodology behind it, um, but how is that useful perhaps for other pieces? Um, and I think for me personally, um, writing this piece has allowed me to delve into the idea of um, kind of a failure, although I guess uh, what I mean is um, imperfection. Um, none of these answers to the first phrase are sort of perfect in a way that you might think of Beethoven writing. And when I would write a piece of music, I might normally, um, you know, strive to uh, create the, you know, the, the best thing I can and only show that. And actually, I really enjoyed this process of showing my working, almost like a maths problem. And you can hear all the different answers and you can kind of decide for yourself which ones you like and which ones you don't. But the focus of the piece moves um, very much towards the method of creation. And you can actually hear how the algorithm works. You can hear its fingerprints. You can decide for yourself where you think it, it writes something good and where you think that you know, Beethoven would never have written that. Um, and I think that's a really exciting way of working. And it's very much something that I'd like to bring to my work in future that's not so focused on Beethoven um, and just thinking about how you might show the methodology a little bit more. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, I hope you enjoy uh, Parallel Endings. Uh, it's played by members of the BBC Philharmonic uh, Orchestra here. It's for String Quartet.
So thank you to Julian, Lisa, Matt and Eli from the BBC Philharmonic for that wonderful performance. What did you think? Um, did you think it sounded like Beethoven? Did you think it didn't sound like Beethoven? Did it have any characteristics that you thought were interesting or unusual, perhaps as a fingerprint of an algorithm writing music instead of a human? Um, if you didn't think it sounded like Beethoven, why not? And what elements of, of that music are missing? Or perhaps what elements of this music um, simply wouldn't have existed uh, in that time period? And also, on a wider point, what do you think about the role of this kind of music? Um, in this case, the music is being presented as being written by AI, and in fact, that's the whole point of the piece, so that we can hear all these different endings that the AI thinks are equally likely, and yet none of them was what Beethoven chose. Um, but what about more generally? Um, what place does this kind of music have uh, in the concert hall, on the radio, in our video games, in our films, um, and uh, where would you sort of be happy to hear music written entirely by an algorithm and where do you really feel like you need a, a human connection? Personally, I feel like in the concert hall, for example, in the Bridgewater Hall, those kind of concerts where this piece was premiered, I think that uh, AI written music solely by AI uh, is never really going to take off except as a novelty. That's not to say you can't use AI as part of the creative process, but I'm just talking about music wholly written by algorithm here. Contrast that with the practices of uh, companies such as Spotify who are actively creating AIs to populate their playlists so that they can pay artists even less than they already do. Um, or companies that are producing algorithms that can produce music for your adverts for the background of your short films, for example. Where do you draw the line about what you'll accept to be computer generated and what you won't? I think this is a question we're going to have to become increasingly familiar with uh, in the years ahead because these algorithms are only going to get more sophisticated and only going to be able to um, imitate or create or compose music in more and more uh, effective ways. Uh, if you're watching live, I'd love to see some of your reactions uh, with hashtag Prism Future Music because we'll be answering some questions later as well. Okay, so now on to the uh, poetry generation and my collaboration with Vanessa. So onwards to part two of today's Generating the Future event, which is looking at poetry generated with AI. Uh, in this collaboration with Vanessa, uh, we've been looking at ways of interpreting uh, text that is written by AI and working out different ways of generating that text using different data sets, but also, interestingly, different algorithms. I don't want to say too much um, before you hear the music, so we're going to play the music before we kind of talk about the nitty gritty of how it's made. But what I would like to say to you is that you're about to hear four songs. Um, they're called Songs Without Meaning. And they, I've given them this title because unlike traditional poetry or any text you might set that has been written by a human, um, these texts do not have meaning in the way that a human gives it. It's simply a uh, probabilistic curve, as we were talking about earlier, of what words come after what and what words are effective and what looks like um, what it's learned from. But the AI doesn't actually have any idea of what it's saying, or at least we don't think it does. So for these four songs, we've used two different data sets uh, and uh, two different algorithms to go with them. And the algorithms have told us that they're both operating at the same level of accuracy and the same level of efficiency. Um, so let's see if you can hear the differences between the texts in the songs and see if you can see which song is generated one algorithm and which is using a different algorithm. Can you tell the difference? Is it as easy to tell the difference as between two human poets? Let's find out. Charm. App rose. Open it. Edelit. Weed toad. Diane. An interstellar dark Flawn Sudron Teal Lone Do they? 
and intestine and dark bones. Flawed. Surgery. Tail. and open it all did all it way at waiters and murder in the best and song further and see here at best it the sword of natural dynasty and interstellar dark bones but I in the floor they had a sudden and passed corrupt and the tail born. You do not long chop only that moods taught to be contained in herald death. But I, like keel boats, filled my heart. And what an unseen means translator in the hand. Would the river with twilight pong a generation? Chop! Unseen a meeting, sword it, touchable song. Chop! Of fire intellect white. Women, when it was said to be a deceit, what have light you up in sweet or widget? Yes! And you come back, and your face is not so fair as you were led to believe. Galloping, holy. Shop Olive White Cod Galloping Holy Oil Sharp Food Fingers Clarity Olive Orchard Light Feathers Brooks White Heat Cod Brats Christ, galloping, this oil, this holy oil, give me his sharp food, I caught in my fingers, Clara to a leaf, over this olive orchard, what part choke back, at the light, feathers broke, white heat, cut the bread of her crest, I hope you enjoyed that very exciting, wonderful performance uh, by Vanessa of these four songs without meaning. We should be careful though in calling it a performance, um, because really what Vanessa and I are doing, what we're more interested in doing than simply presenting a, a polished piece of music, um, is actually showcasing our creative methodology and showing how we're thinking about interacting with this kind of technology and interpreting it at this time. And for this reason, um, to kind of uh, I guess take on the point from Parallel Endings earlier, in that showing your working kind of mind frame, we're going to give you another performance of those songs a little later on uh, that's interpreted very differently. And you can kind of make up your mind as to what you think a better interpretation is or how you think we might interpret these kind of things. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, 
So we're going to hear, I'm going to talk to Vanessa a little later um, about how she's approached these texts and the difference between uh, using these kind of texts and, and one written by a human. Um, but I thought I might go into a little bit of detail, if you're interested, um, about how these are created and, and how I went about um, sort of uh, generating these, these wonderful texts. So they use two algorithms, as I mentioned earlier. Both of these algorithms have been implemented um, by Christopher Meelan, who is the uh, PRISM software engineer. Um, and Chris joined us at the start of this year and has been really instrumental in, in allowing us to um, do a lot more hands-on practical experimentation like this, which is really brilliant. So one of them, the algorithm that's in the first song, is called CAR RNN, which means character RNN. It's a kind of a basic RNN. It simply learns English, um, in this case, um, from the data set and builds it up character by character. But what's interesting is this, this um, algorithm, when you stop it very early on in the training data, you know, but before it's fully trained, it really easily gets the structure of a poem, really easily gets the grammar. And if you were to kind of blur out the words and just look at the shape on the page, it's absolutely convincing. Even very, very quickly it learns that. However, um, where it comes a little bit unstuck is in the actual content of the words and how the words relate to each other in a way that works on uh, a sentence by sentence or a stanza by stanza level. Um, now, some data scientists might find this a bit of a bug, but actually Vanessa and I thought it was a real feature. Um, the fact that um, you can really see its focus on one area of poetry, um, but it's having difficulty with what we would consider basic things, like um, even inventing its own words. So the first song, you probably noticed, um, starts with Vanessa just um, uh, speaking these invented words and then sort of giving them a pitch and then from there we go on to look at the rest of the material. Um, the second algorithm which produced the text for actually the other three texts is based on OpenAI's GPT-2 algorithm. And this is a really uh, famous algorithm that's really very good at producing um, like article type content um, and like news articles or digests or it's really good at that kind of conversational style English. Um, but it takes a little bit of work to get it to write kind of more abstract work like we're looking at today. Um, so how this works is it comes fine, it comes with a big model um, that's trained on all sorts of uh, English from all throughout history, and then we fine tune it on poetry, which is what we've done. So we've said, take what you've learned and apply it to this much smaller poetry data set. And what you might notice from that is that uh, those texts were a lot more coherent on a macro level. Um, and in a sense, they produce what you might better poetry and what you might ex you know, expect to see from a human poet. But that doesn't necessarily make them better for setting to music. Um, in both cases, um, which is really interesting to me, the loss of the algorithm was the same. So the loss is a statistic. I'm going to drink some of this and then put it down. I've just been holding it for ages. So the loss is a number that the algorithm um, gives you to tell you how accurate it is with relation to its data set. So a loss of zero would theoretically mean that the output of the algorithm is indistinguishable from the data set. Okay? Um, so these two, uh, data, these two models that we've used, the CAR RNN and the GPT-2, they're both operating at the same loss at the moment. So theoretically, the text you've just heard set to music and that you'll hear again later on, each algorithm is telling us that they are uh, equally convincing. Um, they are equally good at aping human poetry. But of course, the content of them is very, very different. And that to me is really interesting. How you can have two different algorithms that are clearly prioritizing different types of uh, text, different types of structure, different types of words, relationships. Um, and that's just due to the internal mechanisms of the algorithm. And this gets onto something that I think is quite important that we should remember when we're talking about AI and machine learning, which is that it's not all homogenous. Um, each data scientist and each algorithm that they produce has very different fingerprints and very different qualities, and you can't simply mush them all together into AI-generated music or AI-generated art or whatever. We need to be a little more detailed than that. So. Um, before we get to talking to Vanessa, I'd just like to fill you in on what the data set was that we trained these algorithms on, um, in case you're interested. So we built up uh, a data set of poetry, uh, which 
include a lot of my favourites, which is uh, 20th century modernism and imagism or the imagists, um, and a few of Vanessa's favourites as well, um, including William Blake. Um, and we also put in as much Manchester-oriented poetry as we could. So we tracked down some contemporary Manchester poets, I think uh, five or six of them, uh, and bought their books and added them to this to this algorithm as well. So we've got this kind of Manchester tinge, but also this you know very much abstract T. S. Eliot, uh, Hilda Doolittle kind of uh, end to it as well. Um, so that the curation of the data set is absolutely fundamental to the kind of uh, material you get out the other end, and that is why some of the words and phrases that the AI uses are the way they are. We would have a completely different result if we train the algorithm on, say, John Milton. Uh, and of course, even getting away from poetry, we could train it on plays, on books, we could train it on articles, we could train it on anything, any written word. And so that is also really important to remember when we're exploring algorithms is, yes, different algorithms will produce different results, as we've heard, but also different data sets will produce wildly different results. It's a big field, and there's a lot to explore. Okay, um, so I think I'd like to talk to Vanessa and see uh, how she came about in interpreting these words and what she thought. So without further ado, let's do that. Hi, Rob. Hi, hi, Vanessa. Thank you for that amazing performance that we've just seen. Um, and I think it's going to be really exciting to kind of get your take on a lot of the things that we've been talking about and also explain maybe what we've been doing to the audience who kind of have, have no idea that the crazy uh, hoops we've been jumping through to try and get this material um, off the page. Um, so the first thing I kind of wanted to ask you about um, was how you've interpreted the, the score itself because um, there's quite a lot of freedom in the score isn't there and kind of graphic -y elements and, um, and maybe you can run by what your idea was for example in that first song where we saw um, these sort of black bars uh, maybe you can sort of just talk a little bit about what's going on there and, and how you came up with that idea? Um, well, what I did was that I spoke all the, the words as deliberately as I could, the ones that weren't blacked out as deliberately as I could, and I was actually mouthing the rest of the words in between, in the, in the black bits. So in order to create that sense of a line, in order to create meaning, and um, even though the words don't make much sense, I do try to have my own subtext for them and try and make sure that just because they're not words in the English language, they can't be words that are part of the, who says they can't be words part of the AI dictionary. So that was the mm. um, textual sense of things for me. And when it came to pictures, I did try to make it, well, music is always a vehicle for expression. So I tried to show how the, um, the music would match my, interpretation of the word at least you know so the pitch isn't just there purely as a pitch i did try to sing it with express as expressively as i could yeah did you find it difficult to um kind of match match that sense of roboticness with a you know um a creative performance or was that actually quite a good thing it was yeah. i don't think it was robot robotic in any ways because the nature of poetry is that half of the work done is by the reader you have to fill in your um, your own interpretation. It's so abstract. So in that sense, I treated it like any other poem from a poet, as obscure as it might be sometimes, or um, not understandable. I just take it as part of the whole um, poetic process. Mm. And I think it reveals a lot about, you know, conventions of poetry. I did lean back on that, say, um, with the words that I didn't understand, I leaned on say the rhythm of the uh, the rhythm of the words, how many consonants there were, how long the vowels were. For example, idolet, it's a lot longer than say apros, because it has a double consonant there. So yeah. I would, um, each time it sort of changes how I interpret it, but <laughs> I do link it with um, with existing words in my mind. So, so I always thought idolet sound like emulet. Uh, emulate. Yeah, I don't know. Does it make sense in that way? Um, yeah, so that sounded like apro. Yeah, sound. it does. Um, either let sound like a verb, and I tried to, <laughs> I tried to make meaning in my own way. <laughs> in the yeah, that's that's meaning. brilliant, and I think that well, that that can kind of get us on to the second thing we were, um, I was hoping to talk to you about, which is 
Um, when we're talking about meaning with these algorithms, um, so the first song, where these words that you've just been talking about, uh, they, they come from the first song, which has one algorithm, which is inventing words. Um, the other songs, they don't invent words so much because um, it's, it's a different algorithm. And I wondered just what your take on was the difference between these two algorithms. Could you tell that it was like a different program writing the first song to the to the other three songs, or um, was that was that not really um, clear from the text they gave you? It was sort of clear because um, the words made sense. Yeah, <laughs> of course. But apart from that, um, I suppose it's more conventional which you mm -hmm. know according to um what you've trained it to do is what we expect apart from that it is still slightly uncanny you know that whole uncanny value thing because of the adjectives that are just slightly strange just not words that you use in society you know <laughs> and it's not codified mm -hmm. in any way so i understand the ai won't know it unless you tell it specifically but it's things it's the way you describe things or it's the way you put things in in a phrase it just it just didn't quite sound normal yeah that so, it affected the um the creative performance of course yeah i think that maybe what i found i don't know if you agree with this is that the focus of the algorithms are in slightly different places you know the first one it's focused on this as you said earlier the, the rhythm of it isn't it and this the way that actual consonants match up and make like the sort of architecture of poetry, whereas the, uh, the algorithm for the second three songs is maybe um, more interested in, I don't know, creating, yeah, as you say, you know, adjectives and, and phrases that, that yeah, kind of make sense, yeah. but don't. <laughs> yeah, well, the first song, um, it's just concerned with pure linguistics, you know, the roots of words, how, how what comes after this sort of word, um, how is a sentence created? Yeah, um, and I guess leading on from that, um, this may be a bit of a leading question, but maybe not. Um, do you think either of them is, is better for this purpose or, or are they just different? You know, what's your thought on that? I think they're definitely different for different purposes. The second one mimics, say, a normal poem. So mm. um, creatively, I suppose, it's quite similar to um, a regular sort of lead concert, like nonsense poetry, uh, nonsense poetry song. Whereas the first one, it seems more similar to say uh, Dada or um, Dada poems, you know, where you focus on the quality of uh, yeah. syllables, less, yes. less so about, you know, whether the words, uh, what the words mean to you, but what are the quality of the words itself, deconstructing it. Yeah, and that's something we tried to lead into a bit, wasn't it, as well, this mimicking idea. Yeah. Is with the second and fourth songs, you know, it's very much mimicking styles of music, isn't it? We have this kind of singer-songwriter idea in the second one, and this sea shanty idea in the fourth one. Mm -hmm. And I guess I never really thought about that before, but that matches very well, doesn't it, with the yeah, with the focus of the yeah. algorithm as we're talking about. Yes. Great. Um, so moving on from that, I mean, I well, we kind of already touched on this, but like very quickly. Um, are you approaching the, these graphic scores or these scores in a different way um, to human created material apart from the stuff we already talked about? And I guess that here I'm getting into um, how are you how are you approaching meaning in these scores? You know, do you feel that there is any meaning behind what the AI, AI is writing, or is it a different meaning, or is there no meaning and you're you're we're putting it on all ourselves? Well, I tried to. Um... Well, in the case of these scores, I try not to put too much on, on thinking, say, um, what did the author intend in that sense? Because if I want to make my own personal mark or mm. have, um, have a bit more creativity with it, I try and disregard that in the first instance. Always, do you mean? Or just with these? For, um, for working with graphic scores. Okay, yeah. For working with new um, contemporary music in that sense. I try to approach it with fresh eyes and then mm. consider oh, what, what made the composer have thought of to add that on. So um, for, this one, for this one, at least, it was just the first, first step in that sense. Just try and consider it, treat it as a real um, sort of human created art and try and approach it from my way. I'll be not being able to talk to the AI and just say, why yeah. did you do that? Um, it was quite liberating, actually, I thought. Okay. Oh. 
Hello. Yeah. I thought it was quite uh, liberating. Yeah. Um, considering uh, I'm approaching this as a performer, it's really interesting enough in itself. I'd like to ask how you approach the material as a composer when you first receive the output that you receive from this algorithm. How do you think, oh, that would sound really well to music? How do you select specific text? Because mm. you mentioned you had quite a lot of material to choose from. So how did you choose the text? And then, you know, what came up when you were setting it to music? Yeah, well, you're right. There is a lot to choose from. Um, I mean, you can get as much as you want, really. But you could just, it just keeps going. And you can adjust different parameters to make different things come out. But yeah, you, you get a lot of text. Um, and a lot of the um, process in, in at least selecting them is just creatively cutting things down and looking for connections between different uh, songs or different things that could become songs or bits of poetry or whatever you want to call it. So in this case, I wanted to select um, a couple of them that uh, had different focuses, but you know, similar in some ways, like with songs one and three, but also there's this idea of um, water comes back a few times and I was, I was kind of interested in bringing that out. Yeah, uh, in terms yeah. of actually setting it the text, once you've selected it, I think it chimes a lot with the liberation that you were talking about, um, because you know, you're totally free to uh, assign your own meaning to this text. And not only is there no author, there's also never been a reader of it either. You know, yours is the reading and that, that's quite exciting. Um, and it really feels like you're doing some um, you know, just something quite um, new and original is, you know, to actually find this object and, and get meaning out, out of it. Um, and then secondarily, um, the more you work with these kind of texts, the more I feel it's like translation. So you're trying to, you have this weird language that doesn't quite make sense and you want it to make sense in your language. And like all translation or interpretation, you need to um, select which bits mean something to you and, and move them into your language and other bits you, you maybe approximate or you leave behind entirely. I, I do think that as well because behind the, po behind the words, behind the poem itself, there is no ego. So there is isn't another creative mm. force to think about, you know, to negotiate with. So in that sense, it's sort of freeing. You, you are the sole creator of it, you know. Yeah. And the AI is not going to ring you up and say, hey, that doesn't really sound right. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, that's true. Okay, so just, just to finish off, I just want to sort of get your thoughts on this issue, which I'm often thinking about, which is that, um, you know, poetry is a recitative um, art, I guess, and it's, you know, uh, a lot of it is about how you speak it and, and how the words come through your mouth and all that kind of thing. You know, it's a very embodied idea. And, and so is music as well, obviously. You know, music is tied to the body, especially for a singer. Um, and an AI doesn't know what a body is, and it doesn't know what words sound like. It doesn't know anything apart from the text that we've given it. And I wonder just what your thoughts were on whether an AI in general could ever write something that um, has that sense of embodiment as a human does, or whether that matters or not. Well, I think it matters um, if it turns out in some of the adjectives, choices that it uses, like, um, was it sharp, holy, or sharp? Claret sharp, um, or something like that. And for several words that say onomatopoeic words, where you where you sense them, where you hear them, are words that are very um, sensual because you feel them. Or um, some some words, I do think they come from a um, they don't come from an intellectual experience fully. They come from a from a relationship with the world, from with nature and with uh, the world around us. So I think the AI might not have the same ability as humans to, to select words that are specific, because in, in the body of a poet's work, you can tell that they have se several, they have a style, you know, they have a certain mm. experience, but the AI has basically all of the experiences of the data set that you give it. So it's less specific in that sense sometimes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Great. Okay. I think that's probably about all we have time for. So thanks again for your, uh, your performance. It's been really amazing and for chatting um, and for taking part in the whole event. Um, yeah. So, and thanks for watching everyone. I think we're going to finish off with some more uh, music for you to enjoy. So bye-bye. Charm, Aprose, open it.
Adelaide. We did. Diane. An intestine dart. Flawn. Sudren. Teal. Lone. Char. Approach. Open it. Idolet. an unseen knees translator in the hound while the rainbow with twilight toy palmer generation unseen a meeting so did meeting so did touch of a song chop of fire intellect women when it was said to Galloping, dissolve this holy oil. Gave me sharp food, I caught with my fingers, claret with leaf. Over this olive orchard would but choke back at the light. Feathers brooks white heat. Cold the broods of her crest. Near and near and almost for the dark seas drift, no shot to match the wrecked ships, no ploughed land, only reefs in the light, the shoals, the dingy boats, rending in the eye. Sure. 
去